to a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD at the University of Sao Paulo. And during this time, he achieved some of the most powerful telescopes in the world at the European Southern Observatory in Chile. And um, he has since moved to Durham uh, to the Department of Astronomy, as well as a postdoc. Uh, his research involves looking at star clusters and how they can be used to uh, look at the evolution of galaxies uh, that they're in. Uh, but tonight we're going to be talking about some spin off technologies and what their original applications were in research. So let's welcome Bruno. Something that's 
um, I don't know, for a um, long time scale of a return. And it's also a very high risk. So it's like going to, uh, to put some money in a bat and you don't know when you have some, something back. So the governments take charge of this. So because if you go to a company and say, okay, give me some money and I will do, develop some product of myself and I don't promise any return in the lab in the next 50 years. Do you think that anybody will give you some money? I don't think so. So the government has uh, this uh, task to provide this to society. So here it comes uh, some science. So NASA as a branch of the government, as an example here in this case, uh, can provide us some intangible goods as the knowledge and this comes with the taxes that our families pay for that. Right? Okay, so that's perfect. But what about this relation here with the branch of the government, with intangible goods, with knowledge, providing some things that doesn't produce any uh, interest for the firms? What about this relation here? Is that possible to have a relation with them? So the answer is yes, and that's the the technology transfer that's called this NASA spin-off and everything, that, that's the topic of this talk here. And I was talking about also about some knowledge that's producing by, by NASA. So I don't have a clock here. Right. So technology transfer. We have many, uh, basically two big space programs in the world. That's the American and the European. Uh, the American soldier, uh, they started with this program of transfer technology from uh, space exploration or astronomy or anything to companies since 1976. And the European uh, agent, space agents, they started in the 90s. Um, they have, up to now, almost 2,000 technologies that were transferred. We have like plenty of things that we use and we don't know that are related. Uh, and the European are started late, so they have 200. And here, the, the European just have a, in mind, they have 20 countries, and here is just the states of US. And of course, they have some big, very big projects that are made together, so they are not like com competitors. We're doing science in a universal level, so everyone here can contribute to that. So the, the Hubble Space Telescope is um, a joint project between the, um, the two, the European and American. Rosetta is becoming very famous now. Have you seen this uh, comet landing? That's what is the Rosetta. So it's a, a mission, uh, joint mission between the two. And before talking about the three cases that I promised here, uh, I'll talk about some other very popular technologies that are usually related to NASA, and they are not exactly in, they were not exactly invented by NASA. So one of them is TAN. <laughs> so many people say that TAN was invented by NASA so they can provide some very good breakfast and drinks for the astronauts and there in space. What is true is that it was really invented by this General Foods. It was a small company, and, uh, and in the same the same period, there were some experiments in the space. So they were trying to go to put some men in the space and trying to to see the effects in the human body of uh, zero gravity and so on. So there were some eating experiments, experiment, and to drink water with some flavor they adopted TAN. So after that, of course, TAN was smart. So the, the guys who let like, sell these using TAN, the dreams of the space, so the astronauts <laughs> choice for that. <laughs> and, uh, there was like the life support system of an Apollo astronaut, and there is including <laughs> TAN here. So. They're smart, so there's some stuff. The flow is another thing. 
that many people say, so the flow, I was a guy that many, many years I, I said, no, the flow was a <laughs> Apollo mission and they were using this in the show. No, that, that, that's true that NASA used that, but NASA didn't invent it. That was invented many, many years before even NASA was thinking about going to space. So in 1938 was invented. And NASA applied it to, to some heat shields, the nose of the, the space shuttle that's black. There, there are some material based on the film as well, the cargo hold, the space suits, and there, there are many applications of, of that. So that, that's why the film became famous and related to, to, to NASA as well. So, this is another thing that many people say that it was invented by NASA. I was the, the Swiss people in the 40s. I guess that I read something about that that was basically the name of these insects that stains out your clothes. So they have some micro holes thing and close their, their fabric. So it's based on these animals as well. So anyway, the thing is, NASA applied this to Apollo mission. So they have many, like three astronomers, three astronauts going to space, and at zero gravity, you know that if I leave this here without my hands, it's going down. In zero gravity, if I leave this here, it's just stay here. If I just push a little bit, it stays flying infinity. So here they have like an example for food and some utensils. So they have magnets here and some like velcro. So it's just organized stuff, but it didn't invent that. The barcode. Barcodes, I was trying to look, trace back, I mean, the very beginning of barcodes usage, but everyone claims that, no, I invented the barcode. No, I invented the barcode. No, I used the first, the first barcode that was vertical 1D. No, I used the first 2D. All inventions, who really invented something, it's really hard to say. If you go to history, and, is there anyone from history here? Humanities? No? Usually, history depends on who tells you the history, because you have many facts, and how you collect the facts depends on the people who are, what they are interesting or to tell the story, so it's hard to do to tell. But there are some, I just picked the first appearance of something related to our code here. And as I developed some special type of barcode that's very useful for, for catalog anything. So NASA, they don't have a peace squeeze, they have space shuttles. So they put some <coughs> technology, special technology to, to have some barcodes that were suitable for very, very hard environments in the space and to not do boot or melt. Smoke detector, it's another thing that annoys. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a lot. If you are cooking, for example, <laughs> and they have like cooking and there are a lot of smoke and fog and oh. yeah. So uh, NASA didn't invent this, but what, Na what NASA did was this: they developed one smoke detector, very special, that there was some adjustable sensitivity, and this was useful uh, for cooking afterwards. Because when you're cooking, you know that there is no fire in no your place, right? So we can just adjust that, okay, let's say, let's say to, the, to the smoke detector that this is not a fire, that, oh, that's fine, it doesn't have to, to alarm. And they produce this, but it's no longer available. Medicine, there are many applications of NAS as well, although MRI was not developed by NAS, it was a Improved by NASA, let's say. So MRI, uh, it was developed in the 70s. It's uh, based on resonance magnetics. So if you go to the atoms and see the, how they behave through some strong magnetic fields and blah. So there are some technologies involving that. But this, this, there is nothing related to NASA. NASA, what NASA did was they developed some technologies to, to look at images in <coughs> very high precision. And these technologies were applied, applied to MRI to, to improve the, 
the sharpness of the image then gets in more details immensely as well. Other things, some cordless power tools. So we have like some, uh, an example here that was used really at the moment. It was developed by Black and Decker. And this is something that's, um, okay, NASA didn't develop this, but at the same year, or close to the same year of the invention of this, NASA hired some or made a contract with some companies here to develop specific tools for, for, um, for NASA. There are some curiosities here. Imagine an astronaut in the zero gravity going to make some um, maintenance mission to, I don't know, let's say, Hubble telescope. And they go there, and they have a range, and there, there is a screw there. And the guy tries to screw them. And once he does that, there is no turn. I mean, the astronaut turns to the zero gravity. So, how can you solve that? So this was one of the things that they developed. So they, they find a solution, found a solution that first program. And also a, a hammer drill as well. Developed. Okay, so as I promised, there are some three cases. And as you already found out, there is no like very straight, like, okay, there was some 2000 technologies that were developed by NASA or to NASA applications, let's say. Because all these cases that I said, they were related to NASA. Really. However, the first aim or the first object of the invention were not directly related to space missions or astronomy. Here I'm going to show some cases that they might be or not invented directly by NASA itself, because NASA as well just make contracts with companies and hire technologies. But they were targets to 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 some astronomical issue, let's say. So CCD. Who has a cell phone in the pocket? <laughs> Who has a camera? So everybody has a CCD in your pocket right now. And you are using this all the time. And probably you never thought about what this is. I don't know, maybe many engineers and scientists here, you probably talked about what is the as you know. But like regular typical people in the street and you stop them and can you take a picture of me? And do you know that there is a CCD no, no, sorry, a cheek. <laughs> okay, a CD. It's basically this uh, device here. That's a charge couple device. Some matrix here of uh, pixels in some material like <laughs> silicon or something that's based on the, the Einstein uh, principle that uh, there were some transformations between uh, from photons to electrons. So basically we can point our telescope to to some light point source or stars, galaxies or anything. And the focus of the, the beam of light comes to this device. And the photons are transformed in electrons, and this is much more stable than more precise and stable than previous technologies for image registration, such as these uh, photographic films and photographic plates in the case of astronomy applications. So uh, the inventor of this were these two gentlemen here. Uh, this is from Canada. Boy from Canada and it's made from the US. And, and do you recognize his name? Do you know anything special about him? Recently used or anything? If they won a Nobel Prize in 2009 by the development of these CCDs. So this was a very revolution in many aspects, in particular astronomy. Because of these uh, photographic plates, they were not very stable, they were not linear. I mean, the CCD, you have one photon, one electron. And I don't know, the gain is not okay, but the principle is that for a chemical emulsion there, it's not like very stable, we don't have like a very spatial resolution that can separate everything. So, okay, so here's, here are the 
seven reasons why CCD works very, very important in astronomy. So high quantum efficiency. This means that you can have a uh, very uh, bright and dark in the same image in a very high range. Linearity is just what I explained. What one photon means one electron, and that's it. So you can really trust on what you're seeing, and you can have control of that. And you can, uh, it's easy to use as well. It's electronic, so you have, also have a good electronic device. It's working so you can go towards the computer and you can manipulate everything. And it's very, very, very powerful. So here I show some applications in astronomy. Here's a mosaic of many CCDs. They have gaps, so you have to do many images to cover all the gaps. And this is the field of view in a telescope compared to the moon. So this is one degree here. So this is like this size, the electronic device. And you can see one degree in the sky. And that means the size of the moon. Just to have a, a good relation. Outside is fog, so I don't know if afterwards you can go to see stars tonight, unfortunately. Let's see after. But this is a, it's a good group to, to know distance in the sky. So if you have here, like 25 degrees, just do that, and this is 20, more or less 25 degrees. And I have all these uh, other things here, and this would be one degree. Right, so if you're looking at this, this small square here would be one, one degree. And one degree is what you're seeing here in this entire thing. So that's it. And with the CCD, you can have these mosaics and construct everything. And you can also have very, very good precision in spite and spatial resolution. And here, it's a very, very important uh, scientific result from these telescopes at ISO in Chile. This is the first direct, you know what is that? So this is the first direct image of an exoplanet, I mean, out of our solar system. So this is the, a brown dwarf and a, a small giant planet here. And the, the size of this image, it says here that this is between the, the two stars, the star and the the planet, but the size of this, this image is more or less one arc second. I mean, it's one above six, 60 of this degree. So if you do that in the sky, you have to divide your finger by 60, and this small square is exactly what you are seeing in this square. So this was um, permitted by the development of the CCDs and everything. Of course, there are more technologies and other stuff involved in the telescopes, so like adaptive optics and other stuff that have to do with the atmosphere because the telescope's here. And when you're looking to there, that very small portions in the sky, the turbulence of the atmosphere also affects the image. So it's not very sharp and you have to correct the effects of the atmosphere. So there are many other technologies involved. But one of them that was very, very important was this uh, CCD. Uh, here it's another uh, comparison of what the, the improvement of CCD is. This is the uh, Apollo 11 and based on photographic plates. You can see that's a very beautiful image and very sharp and you can see many details. That's right, but these for close pictures, images and okay, you can do many stuff and not complain. The past we did many stuff just by naked eye. The Greeks developed many stuff. That's fine. But you're talking about the tapes now. And with the CCD in Hubble, let's say without the atmosphere facts, you can go to space. You can see many details here. It's a planetary nebula. So we have a star that exploded at the end of its life. And it remained in a, a white dwarf here in the middle. And you have all this remnants of the outskirts of the star that exploded. So when you look at a star, when a telescope, you can all, also only see the surface of the star, on the atmosphere. 
We cannot look in the side, inside. So to understand the physics of what's going on in a star, it's important to know the chemistry of everything that's inside. Just to check if our models or our physics of everything we know are corresponding to, to the reality. So when you see a star exploding, we can see the inner parts of the star. And if you have CCD and Hubble Space Telescope, you can zoom in this and zoom in. You can see these globules here. That they are dust and they are flying in the exploding and they are carrying some, some information about that. Just, just a table of two pieces. Another thing, comparison, is a photographic plate of a global cluster. That's what I said. It's just because it's beautiful. This is uh, the most beautiful cast in the daily universe, in my opinion. <laughs> there are some galaxies and people that study this. This is our very beautiful. And you can see this <coughs> in a binocular or a small telescope where I can see this. The thing is, the size of this bunch of star in the sky, it's more or less the size of the, size of the moon. However, it's too faint to see by any time. You can identify it, but it's not fair. As you can see here. Sorry. With CCD and Hubble, you can see all these stars very much at the table. You can separate very, all these very small stars and the faintest stars. And you can, you can see the stars moving. If you take one image now and one image 10 years from now, you can see that the stars moved in 10 years. So you can write these movements here and see what's going on there and maybe find a black hole there if you find some stars moving, I don't know, in some region or so on. <coughs> and I'm going to show a video here that um, it's one of the techniques that we use to derive uh, properties of these star clusters. And it's very intuitive. What it does is take this plot here this is the core, the center part of the cluster. And you have seen that there are some blue and red stars and white. And, and here it's a simulation. And there is no need of this. So this is a simulation based on this image, separating these stars by color and then by brightness. So if you keep all the stars and put the blue stars on the left and the red stars on the right, scaling the colors, and after that we can scale by brightness as well, the vertical, so the bright stars are on the top and the faint stars on the bottom. You can see that there are some regions in this plot that there are more stars and there are other regions that are less stars. And this can tell us a lot of things. So how stars evolve and what's the age of these stars, or what's the chemistry of the chemical components of these clusters. And only looking at the colors and the brightness of stars. So how amazing is that? Everything that you know about the universe based on astronomical astronomical studies is based on light. So that, that's amazing. That's what amazed me. Because you can just look to the skies and take some light and apply all the physics that you know here and interpret this light. You can put on an instrument and you can take the history of you can tell the history of the universe, where you came from, why you are here, and how the, the gas performed. Many, many questions you can answer just looking at light. So that, that's a, another interesting thing. That many people who has a memory from Pilo here. <laughs> so we are sleeping in NASA technology. <laughs> Did you know that? No? Did you know that? That the Pilo is made by NASA technology, so not even know. <laughs> so someone got something from the stock that's fine. But we have tonight. I will go to my my phone tonight and sleep happy. Right. So <laughs> right. So this was really uh, NASA technology developed by NASA engineers or maybe hiring some companies as well. 
Uh, and the invention was made, uh, as I said, not exactly by us. There are some companies, of course, there are some relations directly to that. But they, NASA hired this guy from this company to produce some seats in the, the shuttles that went to the Apollo mission or even the shuttles that went to some missions to this Plato Space Telescope and the thing was about safety so the pilot or the astronauts that were there uh, the seats are very important uh, they had a, a very important sign to avoid some impacts in the entrance in the atmosphere that's very hard uh, and I don't know, all the turbulence that it can have, etc. So this is about safety of the, the astronauts. And this was uh, something that they thought was very important. Uh, and now they are applied to some seats for this pilot here. This is the Brazilian guy. Right? Um, and racing and, and pillow mattress and many health stuff. And there are many other applications for medicine and uh, for animals as well. So here I, I put the size of a phone in astronomy. Um, so the relation that I would say that that it has to astronomy or to science in some some sense, um, I would say that it helped the the safety of the astronauts that went to space to to keep Hubble telescope working. So there were five missions to go up to the telescope. To, to fix it, you know, to, to fix the, the solar uh, panels or some electronics or to improve the instruments or computation and stuff. So there are some issues there. Unfortunately, we had two accidents with Challenger in Colombia. Uh, some people died, but um, okay. the phone had nothing to do with that. And this is actually a view of a um, shuttle here in the Hubble Space uh, the Hubble is on the space since 1990, uh, 25 years, so now we are celebrating because it was not supposed to be that long there. And I would say that these five missions were very, very crucial and were very important, were crucial to, to this big life of the time. So, about astronomy. I would point out some very important discoveries that were made by Hubble. So, that put in this jump from the form to the maintenance of Hubble discoveries, just to relate it. Okay, so, one of these very important discoveries was the farthest, or the most far, this, uh, galaxy from us ever found. So, you can see here the galaxy, right? It's very obvious that this is important. Who can't? So here are some global image and the visible. This is the infrared, and this is another telescope the infrared. Uh, so in the infrared you can see this, and the, the visible you can't. So probably we'll go to the, the infrared to check this out. And can you identify that there is some pattern? The shapes of the gas here, like circular. Can you see something? There's some things. Mm -hmm. You know, like this galaxy is very. <coughs> it's not circular as the other. All galaxies here are more or less ellipsoidal. They should be at least. So here it's, it's very faint. Here maybe it's not that much. But there is pretty good that there are some, some patterns here. With the zoom, well, here it's possible to see very clearly. So this galaxy here is very. So, just a bit of teaching here, theory, theory. it's important to understand. Um, when you're looking distant objects, it means that you are looking to the past. And why? So imagine, you know that the light has a limit, <laughs> limited velocity, right? Uh, finish velocity. If you go to a mirror and look to yourself, so there is the light that comes to you, and the light goes to the mirror, and the mirror reflects you, 
and it goes to your eyes. So there is a path of light that comes from you to the mirror and comes back, comes back to your eyes. So there is a path and the limit to velocity, there is a time. So basically, you are looking to the past. That's why every woman goes to the mirror and says, no, how young are you? You are looking to the past. <laughs> so basically, that, that's the trick. So, and if you go with the mirror very far away, and you are hearing the mirror is there, so the path is longer, right? So the light, there is uh, more time to, to trace it. So, the farther you go, more the past you are right? So, if you are not talking about the mirror, if you are talking about source of light, so you just have one path. So that's why I put this image here. I have a couple of telescopes and all the galaxies here since the beginning. All the galaxies. So basically, Hubble is looking to some nearby galaxies. They are very close, so you can see the light that comes here uh, in a very short, uh, very short time. If you get some light from this galaxy here in the past, what means? The light arrived here at the same time that the light of the other galaxies arrived. However, if you determine some techniques, the distance, you know that the distance of these objects is very, very large. So you can say that the light, the light that you are seeing now, was delivered like many, many years ago. Can you follow this? So, what Hubble observed was a galaxy that was very faint and very distant, and that means that's a very, very old light. Let's see. It could mean that the galaxy doesn't exist anymore, but that light that comes to us now, it was from the beginning of the, the formation of the universe. They say here that it was 700 million years after the Big Bang. We are now. 13, roughly 13 billion years after the Big Bang. So that was in the very early stages of the, the, the universe, and that brings a lot of information. That's important to know how the cosmology models work and so on. And there is another issue. This galaxy is so distant and so faint that you could not observe, in theory, this such a faint and very tiny object in the sky. And there is another fact playing, playing here. That's this gravitational lens. Um, the gravitational lens means that we are here, right? Here. We are here. And this is a cluster of galaxies, very massive galaxies. So we have a lot of mass here. And we have a very faint galaxy, this is our very young galaxy in this one, that's behind this cluster. And, and believe me or not, because Einstein is not talking, it's general relativity. When you have a lot of mass here, the light faints. And it works in the same way as uh, optical lens. If you have some object here, and have this light making the curve, this optical path here, you have the impression that this object is bigger. So you have this effect and more. If the galaxy is behind this, I mean there are some galaxies blocking, you can still see the galaxy because the light is coming here, right? So if you're not here, you could not see. But this massive bunch of galaxies is bending the light, so you can see basically the light that's coming from this galaxy behind. So you have these two effects. You have this bending that's allowing you to, to see the galaxy plus the, the, the increment in the size so you can, can detect the galaxy and the rest of the proportion. So this is also nice. But it's not as beautiful as the global process, right? <laughs> <laughs> they claim that there are some galaxies. Okay, the third case. In, in time. In GPS. 
But your guess is more um, fuzzy correlation here. It's not something that was particularly made advice from astronomers and, and applied to astronomy. But the relation is as follows. This was invented by the Department of Defense in the US. So the Americans wants to, to use the space and the money that they had um, just to have control of everything and to know that everything is working well and to have some, uh, when you have many telescopes uh, in the space, you can lose their position as follows to, to know your position. So it's based, it's based in arithmetics. So if you have at least three telescopes, three, sorry, three satellites, and your position here at the center, you can derive very precisely your position. So if you have one satellite rounding the Earth, so it can be anywhere. If you have two satellites rounding the Earth, you have an intersection in two points here. So you can have two, two positions possible. And if you have a third, a third um, satellite, you have here uh, one specific position. So this is very basic, and they use that. That's fine. Okay, what about astronomy and stuff? Right, we know our position very precisely based on the satellites. But what about the satellites? How do they calibrate themselves? How do they know their position? So they have to calibrate something else. They cannot go to this to the Earth and see. Also, oh, here's the Big Bang. Here's the you know, environments. You know, it's not precise, and you have a circular calibration. No sense. So what they do is go into the stars. So they use the position of the stars to calibrate their positions. And these were very used uh, in the beginning. And then they realized when you had more precise instruments and CD and all, all this stuff that are present, they realized that these stars had have their own movements. I showed you a picture showing that the global cluster with the improvement of astronomy you have some movements intrinsic to the stars and it can detect that. So it cannot use precisely the position of the stars as a reference for this. You can, also you know their movements. But to derive their movements is so complicated you need, there are some missions now dedicated to that, but it's easier if you go to far away uh, objects. And they chose the quasars. Quasars are quasi stars objects, but this is just the name because they are actually very active galaxies. They are radio sources, very producing a lot of en a lot of energy, and you can see this energy using radio telescopes. And they are so distant that their movements, there they can have some movements, but they are so distant that they are stopped by our proceeding. So you can use that, that, that. So radio telescopes are being used now to calibrate these and send information to the telescopes and calibrate them. So one of, let's say, about science that can be made with using radio telescopes. Uh, I mentioned something about uh, visible light, infrared light. I, I, I assume that most of you are scientists, so you know about the, uh, the wavelength difference between the, the light. So you have like visible, that you, the light you see, infrared, that basically you can derive heat. You can take an infrared picture of us and you can see where the, the parts are warm and the cooler. And radio is basically the radio sign that we have for TV and radio and stuff. It's the same. Uh, however, we can see this for very low energy uh, emitting some, some place. So here, one sci scientific application of these radio telescopes is uh, here, this was uh, last year, two months ago. This is a real image of a young star in the proper planetary disk here. And what this means, why is it so important? 
We are now looking for another home because you are destroying Earth, so you are looking for another planet to live, right? And that's why we are developing rockets and looking to space. So we are looking for exoplanets. So we are trying to understand how the planets are formed, to understand how we were formed on Earth, and to to say with more precision if we can get another Earth outside or galaxy or anywhere else. So I try to understand how planets form. And one of the models that says that basically when you have star formation in the beginning, you have a gas and dust in a cloud that with the gravity starts to, to go together and they collapse and start to, to ignite uh, hydrogen and helium. So this is a nuclear fusion that liberates uh, energy and this, uh, this star starts to shine. But there are some remainings in, in the outskirts of this star that starts to rotate. And what starts to rotate? You have this disk here and in this disk you have some rings and gaps and these are starts to collapse as well and rotate and this will form a planet. So this is the model that's very well spread out. We have no evidence because we don't have the right image of this. So now we do. So this is very important. This is made by radio telescopes. And that's it. <laughs>